So we have been discussing the atoms in an external radiation field. We have started discussing that particular problem last time. So let's continue with that problem. We have a, an atom and there is light coming in. So if it is a single photon or single ray, then the energy brought in is the H bar omega. And we would like to discuss the issues related to this particular problem. That, that's the background. And if the first step is obviously to work out the relevant time dependent Hamiltonian, and in order to, work, to do that, we had to describe this light. We, we are taking it to be classical. It's an important issue. External fields are treated classically, and the quantum mechanics is only the quantum mechanics of the atomic electron. So we have formulated this in the Coulomb gauge, we discussed the gauge issues in detail last time, and we have written it in the following fashion. Here, epsilon and n are unit vectors, one describing the polarization, the other is describing the propagation direction, so they are unit vectors orthogonal unit vectors, that is epsilon dot n is equal to zero. Well, obviously, this particular representation is a plane fronted wave, and the propagation direction is the n, and the polarization direction is the epsilon. Well, of course, Due to the, that detailed discussion of the gauge problem, actually we are describing this electromagnetic ray with the phi equals zero and a given as such. Phi equals zero is part of the gauge which we have defined as the Coulomb gauge. And the second part of that gauge choice is that this a is divergenceless. Well, obviously, I have chosen it to be such that to satisfy this condition, but obviously it is a useful exercise to check that indeed that gauge fixing condition is satisfied. How do you do that? You take the divergence of this A and the divergence, well, of course, there are irrelevant details like taking the derivative of the cosine, converting it into the sine, and with a minus sign in the front, etc. But the divergence of A picks a factor from here, because that's the x-dependent part. It is the omega over c times the n dotted into the epsilon, because a is defined by that vector, right? It's defining the direction of the a. So when the n comes out together with omega over c and dotted into epsilon, using the fact that the polarization and propagation directions are orthogonal, so you see that automatically the divergence of a is equal to zero satisfied. So this is really the Coulomb gauge conditions are satisfied by the choice of this monochromatic plane wave. So let's write the name here. This is a monochromatic plane wave. One of the possible representations of a classical electromagnetic wave, right? Monochromatic meaning single frequency. Obviously, that is technically an ideal case only. What you usually have is our beams and the frequencies are distributed in a narrow band, right? How, how precise that you can specify the omega frequencies, I don't know. Perhaps Carmen knows it quite well, right? In the, in the particular field of laser physics or those optics. But the ideal, mathematical ideal, is to take the single frequency and to proceed, eventually bring in the possibility, as we will do soon, that there, there are a, there's a beam of uh, 
rays corresponding to, to going from single photon to a shower of photons and that their frequencies are not exactly omega but in a narrow band around omega. But we will come to that point eventually, but let's proceed with this. Then uh, the Hamiltonian we started with was, well obviously the starting Hamiltonian before sending the light in at t equals zero, we have denoted as p squared over 2m plus say e squared, like taking the simplest of all the atoms to illustrate the formalism before, without really complicating it, because the basic principles are the ones which are at, to be discussed in detail. And this is the starting point of the hydrogen atom, and that when you send the light, this is modified in the usual manner, p minus e over c a squared well, let's denote this as a shorthand, VCR. And then normally we would have an E phi. This A and phi are the ones associated with this new external radiation field we are subjecting the atom to. But the Coulomb choice enabled us to set this equal to zero. And the further Coulomb choice enabled us to reduce this further to what, for example, let me remind you quickly that this is reduced to a over c p dot a a dot p. You, you remember how uh, we have uh, simplified that. So it is twice e over c a dot p in the Coulomb gauge. These are operators, the order is important, a dot p plus p dot a. p dot a is equal to a dot p plus divergence of A, divergence of A is set equal to zero because of this particular choice. And there is also A squared term. Well, it's not on the mathematical ground, but on the physical ground, we drop the A squared, saying that except very high, very strong magnetic fields, this A squared term is very weak and we can, except in the special cases in which we would like to discuss the effect of the A squared, we drop it based on physical reasoning that they are weak. And so they are small as compared to the principal terms. So I dropped that. So then the Hamiltonian has become, for this particular problem, H0 plus Vt, as in, in, that is the usual uh, standard form that we have started with to discuss the time-dependent problem. So what is this Vt? H0 is the H0, the original Coulomb Hamiltonian. Vt is what? It is E over mc minus E over mc a dot p. In order to make the t-dependence manifest, I have written it in this detailed form, because this is the t-dependent part of the full new Hamiltonian now. Okay. So here is the form of the Vt, after all those reductions. This is the form of the A. So uh, let's see whether this is indeed in the harmonic perturbation form that we have discussed previously. Remember, we had discussed two, two forms of time-dependent potentials till now. One is the, the so-called constant. I say it's the so-called because the constant is sort of a bit strange, right? It is a sudden jump at a given point. That's the only time dependence, that single point only. And the other is the harmonic perturbation. This is obviously of the harmonic form of y because this is the cosine. If you write the cosine in, as the sum of two exponentials, e to the plus exponential plus e, e to the minus exponential, you see that it's exactly in the harmonic perturbation, harmonic perturbation form. So let's do that. Let's write this as, the writing cosine as the one half of the two exponentials, a zero epsilon, a zero epsilon, uh, 
e to the i omega over c n dot x minus omega t plus e to the minus i omega over c n dot x minus omega t then we really see the form of the harmonic perturbation explicitly that is so let me do it minus e a 0 over m c e to the i omega over c n dot x times <coughs> epsilon dot p times e to the minus i omega t is the first term. Perhaps I should put the bracket not here, but here. That's much better that way. And perhaps I should even get rid of this large bracket. One term is this. The other term is obviously the Hermitian conjugate. Let me not repeat it because you see it from there. What I made manifest is the time factor. All the rest is put into this group of terms. And second term is Hermitian conjugate because it is the time part is conjugated that the sign is moved to from minus to plus. And similarly, the only other term which is affected by this Hermitian conjugation is the change of sign in here because P is a Hermitian operator, right? The momentum is the Hermitian operator. All the rest are real things. So what you see is, referring back to the harmonic perturbation formalism, it was written as Vt was written as curly V times e to the plus i omega t plus the Hermitian conjugate. So it is what we have as the W curly B dagger. So this is the, really the Hamiltonian that we have. We can now turn on the formalism that we have developed before to work out the, say, transition rate first, and then the differential cross-section next, etc. You may say, what differential cross-section? We'll see what it is now. OK. So. I will define as is the case in the actual uh, laboratory treatments, that is the, by the experimentalists, they define a cross-section. Let me use the notation given in the book, absorption cross-section. Well, you may say absorption. Remember, again, in the harmonic discussion, a general discussion of the harmonic perturbation, we have seen that this particular term with the minus exponential corresponds to the absorption, and the plus one, the other one, is the emission, right? And we have discussed that in detail. This is the emission, sorry, I'm sorry, absorption. And this is the emission as rightly pointed out by your friend Kamil, this is the stimulated emission. It's not on its own. The, the presence of this external time-dependent potential is causing that stimulated emission. So let's discuss the absorption case explicitly. So that's the reason why I have said absorption cross-section. So let me define what I mean by the cross-section. It is a simple term in plain English, but it is defined as the energy absorbed by the atom. Let me show you, drop that term. It's obviously the, it's the atom which is absorbing the energy, absorbed per unit time. Okay. Per unit time as normalized by the incident flux. Incident so 
Obviously, it is energy divided by energy, so that much is okay. There is no additional physical dimension brought in. This is per unit time. So there is per unit time in here as well, because you, if you remember the mean definition of the flux, it is the energy falling on the atom per unit time, per unit area. So there is an additional unit area here. One over area becomes the area. All the rest dimensions, energy and the time cancels. So this has the dimension area. So that's the reason why it is called the technically by those people who first introduced the terminology as the cross-section. Good. So uh, let's write the, the notation used for this uh, cross-section is sigma. I don't know in what's the origin of it. Or originally they prefer, they were using obviously Greek letters and sigma probably was the only one which is unused by the others. So they used it sigma. So sigma, let's put the sub-index absorption, is, first of all, at each, whenever a photon comes in and swallowed by the atom, it is the, the energy brought in is h bar omega. But the numerator is the energy absorbed per unit time. So I have to multiply this by the transition rate, which is the probability per unit time, right? That's the definition of the transition rate. Let's not, uh, I'm trying to use this. Omega is written as such, so W transition rate is to be, uh, I'm using the straight notation so that you don't get confused by the, between omega and the W. And let's denote a word for this, J, the flux incident. I will work this out now in detail. What is this? flux associated with the configuration of A given in there. Obviously, this is classical electromagnetic theory because we said that we are treating the radiation classically. It's external. Therefore, I have to compute this classically. So what is the J incidence? It is the energy falling on the atom per unit time and per unit area. Let's plot a picture for this first, where, here. Sorry, I'll draw, draw, draw the picture in here first and then start computing it. Let's consider this cylinder at the center the atom may be sitting and the base of that cylinder is area, one per unit area, right? And let's consider, take the height of the cylinder to be the speed of light because only those photons in that volume that see away at most can reach and cross this area to define the flux for you. So the volume of the cylinder, volume of cylinder is equal to you have to be careful about the dimensions of course, physical dimensions times the C. So if you forget about the dimensions, that it is obviously you are using CGS units, the centimeter cube, right, times that. That's the volume of the cylinder. So what is the amount of energy in that cylinder? That's obviously the, the flux that we are talking about, right? So this, the J incident is the volume of the cylinder times the average energy density. Why average? Because it's an oscillating wave. Time average is needed, right? So it shouldn't ch change depending on the time that you're observing. So C is the volume times the density U is indeed that particular flux that we are looking for. I put a bar on it to indicate that I have to take time average. It's time dependent, oscillating, right? The, the, the result cannot be time dependent. Time average of the energy density. Density.
So the next task is to compute that energy density. Well, energy density, I'm sure you have seen how to construct the energy density of the electro classical electromagnetic field. It's the, the, the non-ambiguous part is that it is proportional to E squared plus B squared. And ambiguous part is that depending on the dimension, whether the, the coefficient in the front is 1 over 2 or an additional 1 over 4 pi, multiplying it, thus 1 over 8 pi. Well, it all depends on which particular dimension system you're using. The standard one is to take the Lagrangian as such, the free Lagrangian of the electromagnetic field, or some people put a 1 over 4 pi, the epsilon 0 over 4 pi business, right? It, depending on the dimension, if those of you who have read the Feynman books should be familiar. In that particular unit system, and you have that one over instead of 1 over 4, 1 over 16 pi. And the sign is negative. The sign is negative so that this is really one, uh, 1 over 1 half e squared minus b squared. For example, the first one, if you work it out, that's the Lagrangian, whose integral is the action. Now, if you go to the Hamiltonian density from there, the Hamiltonian density you take the second, let's take the second one. So 1 over 2 times 1 over 4 pi, 1 over 8 pi e squared plus b squared. So the starting point, this energy, minus energy is guaranteeing the positive definiteness of the second. Energy should be obviously positive definite. So that its smallest value could be zero. The vacuum should have no energy in order to get zero. So this is the Hamiltonian density or the energy per unit volume, right? That's the meaning of the Hamiltonian density. So what we have to do now is compute the E squared and B squared. Well, first of all, compute E and B, take the square, and then take the time average, because that's eventually what I need. So what is the E? E is minus the gradient of the phi minus 1 over C dA dt. But in the Coulomb gauge, the first term is not there because phi is zero for that particular gauge we have. So it is minus one over C times the ADT. So some of it, it may sound a bit paradoxical to those of you who are not used to these kind of things. When you see the electrostatic in freshman, you say that when there's scalar potential, you have electric field. When you have magnetic potential, you have magnetic field. It's not the case. Electricity and magnetism are very relative concepts. What you see is electricity in one frame is magnetism in another frame and vice versa. We have seen this in detail before. So you see this particular vector potential is creating an electric field and the same vector potential is creating a magnetic field as well. So here is your E and B. And all these things are to be computed starting from that A expression. So let's do that. Let's compute the A and B from these expressions and let's substitute in there and let's to finish it, to get the, the full form of the Hamiltonian density or the energy density. Then you'll take the time average over one period to get the required form of the incoming flux, incident flux in other words. So taking the time derivative is easy. E is E is minus 1 over C. Well, here's the A. You get the, the derivative of cosine, one minus sine, another derivative of the T, another minus sine. So the overall minus sine is there, and omega, another omega you get from there. Twice A0 epsilon dot and sine. Okay, that's what you have, right? So A was easy because e epsilon, the polarization is taken to be the direction of the vector potential itself. But for the magnetic field, you have to get the curl. Curl is a complicated uh, mathematical operation. If you feel comfortable, I will use the index notation, Cartesian. So there is no difference between upper and lower level indices, so it is epsilon ijk dj 
a k, right? In that notation, j and k summations are to be understood, obviously, repeated in the C's. So if I now take the d by dxj there, what do I get? First of all, I have the epsilon i, j, k is sitting there. And we have the 2a0 epsilon k, a carry the index k. It is proportional to the epsilon. So it is the epsilon k, the polarization index, times minus sine. Use the curly bracket minus, because the derivative of cosine is the sine with a minus sign. OK, that's there. Times what? Times omega over c. Here it was nlkl. If you want, you are taking the derivative with respect to the, j, the delta j. So it gives you nl times delta j l, so it makes it nj. So it is what comes out of this omega over c n dot x's dj derivative. Gives you nj. OK. I don't know whether I have to do that two, two additional simple steps. Please repeat it on your own. So what we have, if I can find a colored chalk, I don't. So you see there is epsilon i j k, epsilon polarization k. Look at that combination there. That's the only combination which we are interested, right? What is it? It is epsilon i j k n j epsilon k or n dot epsilon n cross sorry n cross epsilon's ith component. So I can go back to the full vector notation if you want. So it becomes b is equal to twice a0 times omega over c there there omega e to a0 here omega over c in here. So n cross epsilon times the minus sign of omega over c and dot x minus omega t, obviously, right? OK. So you see both the electric and magnetic fields are of similar nature. If, uh, let me use a clean notation, n cross epsilon. So their strengths are similar, right? 2a0 over omega over c, there is a minus sign times here it is in the direction of epsilon, electric field, magnetic field is n cross epsilon. Where is the n cross epsilon? Did I erase this? No, it is not. Here, n cross epsilon is again in the plane, and it is this particular. This is the perpendicular, this is perpendicular, this is perpendicular. Epsilon gives you the E field in this direction, and this n cross E gives you the B field. Well, it's only natural, right? This plane wave, monochromatic plane waves, are such that E and B oscillate, but when they are orthogonal to each other. And their strengths are the same. Why do I say so? Because the strength on here, the electric field is omega over C times 2A0 times the sine, and of course sine, and unit vector epsilon. This is the unit vector n cross epsilon. So if I take the squares, obviously, signs disappear and n unit vectors or n cross e u epsilon unit vectors give you one. So when you take the squares and add up, you get what? e squared plus b squared is 4 a0 squared omega over c squared, omega squared over c squared. From there and from here, so I have to multiply this with 2. I have to let me do it cleanly. Twice for uh, I want to indicate that their strengths are the same, so this is twice. And four is already coming from there. Times sine squared. Omega over C n dot x minus omega t. So this is what your e squared and b squared is <coughs> equal to. So I have to 
buçuk değil mi? Yani we have yet 15. Buçuk mu henüz değil mi? Kaç geçiyor? İyi, 45 dakika. Benim saatim bir 5 dakika gibi galiba. Okay, I erase this portion. So what is the e energy density or the Hamiltonian density? The, I use the same language for that. So u is then 1 over h pi is there. Plus times e squared plus b squared twice 4 so 8 a0 squared omega squared over c squared sine squared the 8 cancel and I have a0 squared over pi omega over c squared sine squared omega over c n dot x minus omega t this is our energy density. That's the energy per unit volume. So we have to take the average, time average per period. So U bar is what I need. U bar is 1 over T. You know the relationship between the period and the omega, right? The 1 over 2 pi over omega is the T. So 0 to T, dT sine squared omega over c n dot x minus omega t. Let's remember the trigonometric relation between sine squared and the cosine. So it is what? So this is 1 minus 2 sine squared is cosine twice cosine to twice the angle. Therefore, sine squared is 1 minus 1 over 2, 1 minus cosine twice. That entire thing I denote by the bracket is the cosine 2. So what is the first term? The first term is 1 over 2t times the integral of dt, t. So it is 1 half, the time average. The second one is what? 1 over t, 1 over 2t actually, integral 0 to t dt cosine twice, twice omega over c n dot x minus omega. Okay. So that's 0, isn't it? Over one period. So your result is, sorry, we have to bring all this factor. That's there. So that's again there. Times one half. So altogether then a0 squared over 2 pi omega over c squared is the time average of the energy density over the period. You see, the energy density depends on the amplitude of the wave in the first place as the square on the natural, A0 squared. And the, the omega over C also comes in as the expression related to the energy. Omega over C. How is it related to the wavelength, for instance? You, do, do you wonder? Let's see how is, it, how is it related to the wavelength. The, use the simple, fresh, the elementary school of physics, lambda equals ct. The distance equals the velocity times the time, right? The simplest thing that we have. So c times 2 pi over omega. So omega over c is 2 pi over lambda. If you want, some people may call it 1 over the lambda bar, right? Bar is something divided by the 2 pi. So it is the 2 pi over lambda squared, or 1 over lambda bar squared. 
Think of it, it's an important physical thing, right? The, the length, wavelength enters in the inverse manner. A0, the amplitude square, comes pr directly proportional and lambda comes as indirectly proportional. Keeping the intensity or the, wavelength, the amplitude fixed and increasing or decreasing the lambda, the wavelength, so you can change the energy density. Lambda is larger, energy density is smaller. Natural, right? Blue light is more energetic than the red light, for instance, or ultraviolet is more energetic than the infrared. Things are so simple, in a sense, when you really look at it in a, a, a close manner. So this is, anyway, to cut the long story short, this is the time average of the energy density. So in order to convert into it into the J incident, that is the incident flux, I have to multiply this with the C, right? Because that was the, the energy inside the cylinder whose length is C. So I can write now J incident is C times U bar. U bar is that, so it is A0 squared divided by 2 pi omega over C. Omega squared divided by C only because one of the C factors in here is cancelled by the C coming in there. So we are in game now. I can now go back to the, our absorption cross-section and I write it as a h bar omega times the transition rate for the particular problem. I will write it in detail in a moment. Divided by a0 squared divided by 2 pi omega o squared over c. So there are some cancellations. Let's do that. So it is h bar c divided 2 pi h bar c. 2 pi h bar c divided by a0 squared omega times transition rate for the absorption problem. So let's write that transition rate now. What was the transition rate? It is 2 pi over h bar times ni dagger square. Depending on whether it's single to single or single to many transition, I have to write it accordingly. If it is single to single transition, then what you have in here is a delta energy conserving delta function. If it was single to many, we would have the density of final states. But here, let's consider to single to single. So, I to N. When it is single to a group, I would put this the group of N. But here it's single to single. So delta En minus Ei minus h bar omega, correct? It's absorption, that is the final En is equal to the original Ei plus the h bar omega and this delta, fun delta distribution is guaranteeing that. So let's put the W squared in I erased it, but let's, let's see whether I can have it from the memory. So it is 2 pi over h bar Ea0 over mc squared. Coming out. N e to the i omega over c n dot x epsilon dot p i squared, that's the remaining matrix element. The, the expression in the front was Ea0 over mc. I took it out of the matrix element. It's the constant squared. And what is left over inside is this operator squared times the energy conserving delta. So this is the transition rate, that is the probability per unit time. So if I now substitute this in there, I to N, so what you get? Sigma absorption then is 2 pi h bar C divided by A0 squared omega 
that's the that factor, times 2 pi over h bar from here, e squared a0 squared divided by m squared c squared times this matrix element squared times the energy conserving delta. It's gratifying and nice that this amplitude disappears. The amplitude of the wave disappears and one factor of C goes away and what else? Uh, H bars go away, you're right. So let's write the expression and then we will turn our attention to more difficult task of determining the matrix element. So sigma absorption then becomes 4 pi squared times E squared. That is divided by C, let's write it as such, and then uh, omega 1 over m squared omega, m squared and n omega, that's essentially it. Times the matrix element squared times the energy conserving delta. Let's put an h bar in here and another h bar in there. I can do that and convert this into the usual form of alpha. 4 pi squared alpha is the so-called geometrical factor describing that it's a quantum phenomenon times h bar divided by m squared omega squared and delta. Let's check the expression because this is complicated. I don't want to make any mistake. Indeed, correct. Okay, good. So this, this sigma absorption, the ne ne next task would be to compute this matrix element. And let's give this a name. Uh, this is N and operator I. Let's denote this as F and I is a shorthand and then we'll take the mod square of it and so f and i and e to the i omega over c n dot x times epsilon dot p i you see how complicated the expression that is so in order to really finish the computation to get the cross section which could be compared against the experiment, we need to compute that e extremely co complicated matrix element. It's an exponential operator in principle involves infinitely many terms of all powers of x. And there is also the epsilon dot p next to it. p is the derivative operator. So, so if you try to compute this for the given electro, uh, electronic uh, levels, even in the simplest hydrogen atom problem, it's a horrendous, it's a horrendous problem. So what we will do next is uh, to develop an approximation technique coming from the physical uh, reasoning, of course, to develop an approximation technique to compute it approximately, because computing it exactly to all others is uh, next to impossible task. Well, you can use computers and you can use numerical analysis. That's easy. So I think it's a good point to stop. Before I introduce that particular approximation, it's called the dipole approximation, electric dipole approximation. We will do it after the break. <laughs>